the book of Ezekiel, chapter 8, verse 1. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Ezekiel got into the spirit. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins, even downward, fire, and from his loins, even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of an hand, and took me by a lock of mine head, and the spirit lifted me up between earth, the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. The first thing I want us to observe is that Ezekiel got into the spirit in order to get his vision. Claudette said that the people go out to their different functions and they throw themselves into it. They set out to enjoy it. They get into the spirit of it, in other words. She said when we come to meeting, we should determine to enjoy the Lord. In other words, get into the spirit of it. And if you read in the book of Revelation, you find that John got a similar kind of a vision of a person of fire and brightness. Then you read in Revelation 1.10, I, John, was in the spirit. And when he was in the spirit, he heard a voice. And he got the revelation of God. When people come to services purely to criticize or to analyze, they miss the target. And they rob themselves. Because the only way to get the benefit out of a meeting is by getting into the spirit of the meeting and then moving with it. Now, I don't want to preach hard this evening. I want to try, if I can, to just talk with you for a little while. And uh, that is why at the beginning of the meeting, as soon as I felt the Spirit moving across the, the church, I didn't hesitate. I got up then and opened the service right away because it was sweet. And it has been sweet and beautiful right from the very beginning. If you believe that, will you say amen? So a prerequisite to getting the revelation of the Lord is to get into the spirit. I don't mean get into the imagination. I mean actually to sweetly and humbly and lovingly and committedly and deliberately meditate on God and yield yourself to the truth of his word. And as you do that, you get into the spirit of what God is doing. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit saith to the churches. There are many people, and hearing they hear not, and seeing they see not, and the eyes are blind. You've got to get into the spirit and into the spirit of what is happening in order to understand what God is trying to say. Now, there are two points I want to bring out tonight. One of them is the readiness of God's 
people to depart from the Lord. The readiness of God's people to depart from the Lord. Let us say that together. I want you to get that. The readiness of God's people to depart from the Lord. Let us have it again. The readiness of God's people to depart from the Lord. And then the other thing I want to get into our hearts is the reluctance of God to depart from his people. Right, now let me hear you say that. The reluctance of God to depart from his people. Again, the reluctance of God to depart from his people. You see, God's people leave God in a hurry all too often, but God is never in a hurry to leave his people. He is always reluctant to leave his people. Now, in the verses we have read, we find Ezekiel getting into the spirit. We find him being transported by vision, lifted up between earth and heaven, and brought in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy which provoketh to jealousy. And it seems like Ezekiel couldn't believe what he was seeing, because in verse 4 he records, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. And then verse 5 says, Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now, the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes, the way toward the north, and behold, northward, at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. So we want to talk about the image of jealousy and the glory of God. Now, it may seem strange to us that you have the image of jealousy and the glory of God alongside each other. But let me hasten to say that even though Ezekiel saw the image of jealousy on one hand and the glory of God on the other, that situation was only temporary because God's glory will only stay so long where the image of jealousy is lifted up. It is not always uh, an evidence of being where God wants you to be for him to be meeting your need. Because the children of Israel were out of the will of God during their time in the wilderness. They were out of the will of God. But God in his mercy gave them manna from heaven he prolonged the life of their clothes and their shoes. He gave them water from the rock. He sustained them in their wilderness experience. But it was not because they were in his direct will, they were in his permissive will. And uh, very often the trial and the test is a greater proof that you're in God's will than the fact that God seemed to be supplying all of your need. Let me bring it up to date with regard to the church of the last age. The criticism against the Laodicean church was that it said, I am rich. I have need of nothing. 
And God said, you are naked, and you are blind, and you are wretched, and you are poor. They had everything, but they had little or nothing. The Apostle Paul put it like this, he said, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. That is what I meant when I said a little, little while ago that we should export what we have to the Americans and the Americans should export what they have to us because they have got the material wealth but I sincerely believe we have got the spiritual power. Hallelujah. Now, the image of jealousy and the glory of God but a purely temporary situation because God will not continue to dwell alongside the image of jealousy. Take for example Samson. Samson time after time went his own way and in mercy God saved him again and again and again. But there came a time when in his self-will, in pursuing his own ideas, there came a time when he went out saying, I will go out as at other times. But he wished not that the Lord had left him. So there came a time when he went out he was taken captive, they burned out his eyes, and he was brought into bondage because he wished not that the Lord had left him. So the image of jealousy, according to the vision of Ezekiel, is on one hand, and the glory of God is on the other hand. And the Lord was beginning to open up to Ezekiel a revelation of his imminent departure from the presence of his people. God was about to show Ezekiel the sequence of events that would culminate in the people of God being taken captive and driven from their land. He was about to give him a revelation of the different, different stages of the departure of the glory. And he prepared him for it. Now, I want you to see the situation of God's people. How ready they are to depart from the Lord. You know, we, we think maybe it is strange. And we consider we wouldn't do some of the things that have been done. But when God brought the children of Israel into Canaan, he told them they were not to fear the gods of the land. They were not to worship the way of the people of the land. And they were to have no other gods before him. But again and again you see the children of Israel lifting up the idols and worshipping with a corrupted kind of worship where they mixed the worship of Jehovah with the worship of Baal and all the other gods of the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and all the otherites. And we think, what a terrible thing that God's people in the Old Testament were so ready to depart from their God and his principles and his word. But I want to say today that the modern day church is doing the same things by compromising truth and uniting with the wrong things in our day and generation. It's time to wake up. 
the image of jealousy is in the place where God's word should be being taught to the children. I want to do everything that I can to rectify that situation. But I will, with you, look at the word. If you turn to chapter 8 and you read verses 4 and 5, you have again the image of jealousy so that God's people are condemned for the worship of idols. Now anything that takes the place of God is an idol. It could be a husband, it could be a wife. It could be a boyfriend, it could be a girlfriend. It could be a job, it could be a car, it could be a house, it could be money, it could be your country. Anything that takes the place of God is an idol. Anything that you find it easier to stay with than you find to stay with God, that thing is an idol. And God says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God condemned his people for the worship of idols. But look at verse 7. This is just a background to the departure of the glory. Verse 7. And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. And he said unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in. And behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw. And behold every form of creeping things. And abominable beasts. And all the idols of the house of Israel. Portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery, for they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. So there you have the worship of spirits. That's what it means when it says unclean beasts and, and different things. That is the worship of spirits. Yeah, you remember when the, the sheep came down with the beasts in it before uh, Peter and Peter wouldn't eat and God said what God has cleansed call not thou unclean. So these kind of beasts and portrayals on the wall speak of the worship of spirits. So God's people are condemned for worshipping spirits. You say, but we wouldn't do that today. But the word of God tells us that in the last days perilous times shall come. And men shall give heed to seducing spirits and turn to abominable things. And because they will not endure the truth, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. People go everywhere looking for preachers who will tell them what they want to hear. Come on now. I'm telling you the truth. God's people run hither and thither until they find themselves a prophet who will prophesy unto them what they want to hear. Well, God deliver us from such things. I have never stooped to it, and I won't stoop to it. It is my job to proclaim the truth, whether it is accepted or rejected. It is not my responsibility to uh, please the people by my prophesying. It is my responsibility to tell the truth, the whole truth, and God help us, nothing but the truth.
So you see, they worship spirits in that they turn away from the truth. How did Saul become possessed of an evil spirit? Because he rejected the word that God had given him. God said all the animals were to be slain. And some of the people came to Saul and said, this is good, you know, you good animals. So Saul kept the fattest of the animals. And when Samuel came to say, Saul, hast thou obeyed the word of the Lord? Saul said, yeah, I have obeyed the word. And then the sheep started bleating. So Samuel said, if you have obeyed the word of the Lord, what meaneth the bleating of the sheep? And then Saul said, well, I just kept back these special ones for sacrifice unto the Lord. And so Samuel said, the Lord's delight is not in burnt offerings and in sacrifices, but in obedience. Now, let the Holy Spirit preach to you. You know that there are people today and they're doing the same things. God has told them where they should be. He has told them what they should be doing. But they don't want to do it. So they turn aside and they make sacrifices and they do everything in their power to try to get the blessing of God and the cooperation of others. But really, God is not interested in that. What God wants is the obedience of his people. The word of God says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Saul rejected the word. And when he rejected the word, he went downward, and he continued to do, go downward, until finally you find him seeking advice from a spiritualist medium, and attempting to commit suicide to get away from what was happening to him. So there are people, and they are the same today. And in the church of God, there are people who worship spirits in that they turn aside from the truth, and then they select teachers who twist the scriptures to their own destruction. But the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth, will lead us into all truth. Praise the Lord. I believe that. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. If you are sincere, somewhere along the road, God will show you what is right and what is wrong, who is right and who is wrong, what to follow and what to leave alone. He will show you what to eat off the plate and what to leave on the plate. He will tell you what to take from the table. If you are sincere and you're prepared to accept the revelation of God, God will lead you, he will guide you, he will direct you. But when you get the word of the Lord, don't keep shining the light in God's face and saying, Lord, 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 what do you want, what do you want, what do you want? When he tells you what he wants, then go to it and do it with all of your heart. Praise the Lord forever. Will you say amen? Then if you look at verse 14 and 15, then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. Now you say, well, what does that mean? That they were weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz was a Babylonian god. A certain man died, and it was supposed that after death he became the god of the underworld. He was a Babylonian deity. And uh, they believed he had something to do with the growth of vegetation. So that they said he died in the summer at the heat of summer but he was raised again in spring 
So here at the temple of God and in the midst of God's people, you had people who were weeping for Tammuz, the deity of the Babylonians. And when they wept and mourned for Tammuz, it wasn't just that they sat and cried, but the women dressed lewdly and behaved abominably, and the whole weeping and the whole uh, sacrificing was steeped in immorality. So there was a depth of immorality as the people recognized and worshipped and respected Tammuz, the deity of the Babylonians, and they were steeped in immorality when they were doing it. So they worshipped Tammuz. Then look at verse 16. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, remember that is the place where God said, let the ministers weep between the porch and the altar. And he saw there about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord. Notice that is a slight to the temple, their back to the temple. And their faces toward the east, where does the sun rise? The sun rises in the east, and they worship the sun toward the east. So you had sun worshippers, and you would think, no, Lord, we haven't got those today, but we do have them. They might take a lot of different shapes and forms, but they're doing the same thing. And some people, they have to get the sun, and they have to get the exercise, and they have to show off their bodies. The word of God says bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all. We should be godly. Whatever else we are, we should be godly above and beyond everything else. If you believe that, will you say amen? amen. Then he said, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? It is a light thing. Is it a light thing? to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here. For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger and lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, Yet will I not hear them. So God had had enough of it. And he was bringing it to a conclusion. He was showing Ezekiel the background for the departure of the Lord. God doesn't depart from his people in a hurry. You can get away with sinning for a while. You can get away with rejecting the word of the Lord for a while. Because you can go your own way and then say, Oh Lord, I'm sorry. And in mercy God will hear you if we're willing to confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But if God's people persist, in going their own way. There comes a time when God says, I have had enough. The Apostle Paul was a man who learned to recognize those times. For he had such an understanding of it that he said there were certain times and places and people where he took it on himself to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the body that the soul might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. God uses sin to fight sin. And I believe if our nation continues in its rebellion against God, the time will come when God will use another godless nation to bring us to our knees. If you study the wars of the world, 
you find that God came in mercy to people. And when they refused it, then in years to come, there came war. Look at chapter 9. Read verse 3. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub. Now, the cherub was over the mercy seat. And the glory rested over the mercy seat. And it spoke of the sacrifice of Christ and the glory of God on his people because of the efficacy of the sacrifice of Christ. But when you look in verse 3, you find that the glory was risen up from the cherub, from the mercy seat, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. Now God was getting ready to go. If I visit you, and I sit maybe at table with you, or perhaps I sit on a settee and have a drink of coffee with you, when it is time to go, the first thing I do is rise up. Isn't that right? God was getting ready to go because of this idolatry and this image of jealousy in the place where God should have been worshipped. You notice it says that the image of jealousy provoked to jealousy. The thing was that they had put something in the place of God. And God, who is a jealous God, they were provoking him to jealousy with it. Not the wicked jealousy that men have, but God's jealousy was because and is because he loves his people. And he wishes the best for his people. But his people force him to turn his back on them because of their perpetual indulgence in idolatry. God says his arm is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But he said, your sins and iniquities have separated between you and your God and have hidden his face from you. I believe we are living in that day in our generation when the the cauldron of judgment is about to be outpoured on God's people. God is rising up, getting ready to go. And then the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the mercy seat to the threshold of the house. And then he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's ink horn by his side. And the Lord said, Go through, verse 4, the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. You see, there is a time when mercy is finished and judgment begins. And I want to be, God help me to be. I pray that he'll help you to be among the people who sigh and cry for the abominations. Because those people who sigh and cry for the abominations get a mark on them that identifies them. So that whatever the judgment and whatever the outpouring Somehow or other, God will hide them in the cleft of the rock until the hour of indignation is past. We want to sigh, we want to cry for the abominations that are in the land. We want to do our best to present Jesus Christ to our generation, whether it is in the open air or through the printed page or through cassette tapes or videotapes or personal communication through letters or telephone calls or visits, whatever way, let us do what our hands find to do with all of our might. There are people who would advise me not to print. 
There are people who would advise me not to invest in print machines. But, oh, bless your heart, I know that one of the most powerful means of spreading the gospel is the printed page. Thank God for our Bibles. That's God in a book. Amen. So, God's reluctance to depart from his people. You see, he rose up from the mercy seat to the threshold of the house. Look at verse 4. He puts a mark on the people. Now I go to chapter 10, verse 4. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. I want you to notice that. The glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold. First of all, you see him rising up to the threshold. But then the next stage is he is over the threshold of the house. I say again, God is reluctant to depart from his people. This message tonight should be an encouragement to us. It should be a warning against turning to the right hand or to the left from the pure, unadulterated word of God. It should be a warning to us against being deceived by any of the deceitful works of darkness. It should be a warning to us so that we stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. But it should also be an encouragement to us because if God is so reluctant to depart from his people, then be encouraged. This poor man can cry, Hallelujah, and the Lord will hear him and deliver him out of all his troubles. Praise ye the Lord. God is a good God. His ear is ever open unto our cry. If we take a step towards him, you'll find he will do more than take a step toward us. Come on to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. If any man will open his heart, I will come in and I and my father will make our abode with him. God is more anxious to bless you than you are to be blessed. Uh, God's people are quicker to leave him than God is to leave his people. The word of God says he abideth faithful. Hallelujah. Glory be to his name. God is good uh, and he is the same yesterday and today and forever. Hallelujah. Somebody praise the Lord. I can just imagine this. The glory of the Lord is risen up. He has gone towards the threshold. Nobody has said, Oh Lord God Almighty, stay. Didn't God say he looked for a man to stand in the gap and make up a hedge? Did he not say in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose hearts are made perfect toward him. I know it's getting late, but I want to get it over to you. God is reluctant to depart from his people. And any sinner who ends up in hell will have trampled underfoot the blood of God's Son. And any child of God who gets out of the blessing of God, they'll only do it by wrestling with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit stands in our way trying to guide us uh, in the right path. And it is only as we shut our ears to him uh, and give our voice to something else uh, 
that we get out of the program of God. Men should be swift to hear and slow to speak because we are snared by the words of our mouth and the word of God tells us by thy words thou shalt be justified and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. No real anointed child of God can be loose with their tongue because as soon as you begin to be loose with your tongue you lose the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You cannot afford to yield your tongue as an instrument of unrighteousness unto sin and when you let words off you can never get them back again so take heed what you say because your conversation is in heaven not only take heed what you say but take heed who you say it about for God says touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm somebody say amen and I say this what I am saying now applies to all of us and in particular it applies to you young men who want to be preachers it's all very well to stand in the pulpit or at the platform and preach but your language when you go off the platform must equal that which you have when you're on the platform Amen and when you preach You've got to live it when you go off the platform. For it's all very well telling people what to do. But if you yourself are not willing to make sacrifices, then you nullify your preaching. Who are you preaching to? I'm preaching to you all. But right at this moment, I'm preaching to the preachers. Yeah, I'm preaching to the deacons. Because our tongues get us into more trouble than our tongues can get us out of. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Be careful who you judge. I'm not saying don't judge. I'm saying judge righteous judgment. And no matter how clever you may think yourself to be, remember that love covers a multitude of sin. And I never, never, never outrightly condemn someone until I have given them ample opportunity to turn from the error of the way. So if you ever hear me condemning anyone, you'll know that I have tried and tried and tried again. And so should we all, because God is like that. God is reluctant to depart from his people. So the glory of the Lord in verse 4 is over the threshold, ready to go. Look at verse 18. And the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims and the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight and the wheels also were beside them and everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above you see the departure you see the reluctance of God it is as though God is looking back You know what I mean? He's looking back and saying, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. It is like Abraham pleading with God for Sodom and Gomorrah. If there are 50 righteous, God would have saved the city for 50 righteous. If there are 40, if there are 30, they couldn't get a dozen righteous in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and therefore the judgments came but God got a lot out of it even though he made mistakes in it God got him out of it the lesson for us to learn is there has got to be a certain amount of righteous people in a family to save that family there has got to be a certain number of righteous people in a community or in a city to save that city or community. There's got to be a certain number of righteous people in a nation to save that nation. There's got to be a certain number of righteous people in the world to save the world. And God is getting so sick of it that he's getting ready to go. 
He's getting ready to go. And I believe the angels of God are already putting the marks on the intercessors, the people who are all out for God. The mark has been put on them. And the persecutions are increasing. But thanks be unto God, uh, if we endure to the end, uh, not only will we be saved, uh, but we will receive a crown of righteousness which the Lord hath prepared for them that love him and love his appearing. Amen. Look at verse 20. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Kibar, and I knew that they were the cherubims. Everyone had four faces apiece, and every one four wings, and the likeness of the hand of a man was under their wings. And the likeness of their faces was the same faces which I saw by the river of Chebar, their appearance, their appearances and themselves. They went everyone straight forward. So you have God over the house. Go on into chapter 11. Look at verse 23. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. Afterwards the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God unto Chaldea to them of the captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up from me. I emphasize again God's reluctance to depart from his people. The glory left the mercy seat. It went to the threshold of the house. It stood over the threshold. It rose up above the threshold. It went out above the house. It went out above the city. And it went out onto the mountain. And then the judgment came. Oh, my friends, don't let us play with this end time visitation of the Lord. You'll get along all right for a little while when you get out of the will of God. You'll get along all right for a little while. But that is not an indicator you're doing the right thing. But in due time, your feet begin to slide. You lose the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. You lose that peace that passeth understanding. You lose that certain something that enables you, when you have nothing, to still be the possessor of all things. That's what the apostle said. The apostle said, we are persecuted, we are beaten, we are striped, we are stoned, we are ridiculed. He said, we are counted the scum. The scum of the earth. But oh God be praised. There were men who were able to say even though we have nothing we possess all things. There were men even when they were in prison they were more at liberty than the people who were guarding them. Because they had a liberty in their heart. Hallelujah. That knowledge, that liberty, that joy, that peace that comes from knowing that you love God, you love his people, and you are where God wants you to be. God, God help us. Uh, I believe that all of our churches throughout this country should hear the message that I am proclaiming tonight uh, for the world uh, is needing the realization that God is about to pour out his wrath. And there must be men and women sighing and crying for the abominations that are not just in the world today but in the hearts and in the lives of God's people the image of jealousy sitting alongside where the glory of God should be and we're provoking God to jealousy God help us I pray to give him his rightful place if he is not Lord of all he is not Lord at all I want my all to be on the altar for him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So renew your vow to the Lord this evening. Lay yourself on the altar once again and ask the Lord to be with you whithersoever you go.